and uh, today we have our second talk. The speaker is going to be Carl Simpson, a man who needs no introduction, and he's going to talk about points near infinity in modular spaces for local systems. So thank you very much. So I'd like to thank the organizers for organizing this great conference, uh, and in this really beautiful and very interesting uh, setting. Um, so I'd like to talk about. Um, so I'd like to talk about some work which we've been doing. This is going to be a sort of a, a review in some way of work that we've been doing with uh, with Lou Mill, with Alex Noel, and Pana Pondit, and also Fabian Haydn uh, made an, some important contributions uh, in motivation for what we're doing, and also with uh, some Andy Yankski helped us with some common, important comments. Uh, okay, so. Let me just start by by talking about the uh, very briefly about the moduli spaces of local systems. So we have so let's just for for now for today let's just have X, oh, sorry x is going to be a smooth projective algebraic curve. Um, one could I suppose uh, try to understand what's happening with the, this whole theory in higher dimensions, but we haven't started to look at that yet. Um, so we have uh, the moduli space, which is usually called the character variety which is the space of representations of the fundamental group of X into, for example, SLR, uh, SLRC that means, and divide by the action, uh, the conjugation action. And this is a GIC quotient in the sense that it's not a, it's not a, it's not really a quotient. The, the points of the space are S equivalence classes of representations. Two representations are S equivalent if they, if they have the same uh, semi-simplification in the Jordan older series. And that this is an affine variety. Uh, Procesi's theorem tells us it gives us, in fact, generators for the coordinate ring, which are the functions trace of a matrix applied on a group element. So we have a nice coordinate ring. The we can th this guy is an affine variety. You can just sort of write down equations. The generator, the generators for pi one of x and its single relation, uh, give you equations for this variety, and then. The GIT quotient is also the space that is in spec of this, the ring of invariant functions under this action. So the, the quotient is an affine variety. Now, uh, this is a classical thing which you can look at for any group. But in the case of a smooth projective curve, we also have two other spaces. One is the space introduced by Hitchin, uh, the space of semi-stable Higgs bundles of degree zero. So Higgs bundle is a vector bundle plus a Higgs field. We'll, we'll have a, we'll see that on, on the next slide. Um, again, modulo the same type of S equivalence relation. And then the M Duran moduli space, it's the moduli space of vector bundles with an integrable algebraic connection over X. Again, modulo S equivalence. I guess I didn't write down here, here I said degree zero, but in fact, for the group SLR, that means that the, we should have objects with a trivialization of the determinant. And now these, this is a sort of a remarkable collection of spaces because uh, these the, the three spaces are all algebraic varieties, but they have a quite different nature. And we have, nonetheless, we have a homeomorphism of varieties between Hitchens moduli space and the other two. And the riemann hilbert correspondence gives us uh, an analytic isomorphism of complex varieties between the, the character variety and the Duran moduli space. This analytic isomorphism is not an algebraic isomorphism, and this is not even complex analytic. Uh, for those of you who know something about it, this complex structure and the complex structure here uh, form a part of the uh, triple of complex structures that gives you a quaternionic structure, it gives you a hyperkähler structure. So this is one of the complex structures, and these guys are the other, are the other one. Now, what I'd like to look at what I'd like to talk about today is really the compactifications of these varieties. Uh, remember that the Betty moduli space is an affine variety, so if it's not just a finite collection of points, then it's non-compact. So it has to have some points at infinity. Uh, there's something called that the topologists have introduced called the morgan shailen compactification, which however is not an algebraic variety, and roughly speaking, it's putting some kind of valuations at points at infinity. Um, on the other hand, the, the, these two varieties are somewhat nicer for the problem of compactification. They have compactifications that are algebraic varieties. I'm not going to write the formula for the compactification, it's not, not too hard. Um, 
but I'd just like to say it, the convectification is, is the, the moduli space plus a divisor, which I'll denote by K. And the, the divisor is the same in both cases. And we can write it down like this. It's, the, it's obtained by taking the Hitchin moduli space, subtract the nilpotent cone. Um, so this means all the points such that phi is a nilpotent operation. And we'll also see in the next map, it's also the, the nilpotent cone is the inverse image of zero under the Hitchin vibration. So we sort of remove something and then divide by C star. This is very much like what you do when you define projective space, right? You take the affine space minus the origin and then divide by C star. So this divisor, this guy is the same guy that goes at infinity in both of these spaces, which is sort of suggesting something which is true, which is that these spaces are closely related in the sense that there's a deformation from one to the other. But their, their, their structure as algebraic properties is nonetheless so now we have the, what's called the Hitchin vibration. So this is a, this is a map. Well, well uh, I'll say what that is again in a minute. Uh, this is a map from the Hitchin moduli space to an affine space. And well, what we saw here is that we have an action of C star on this space. If we go back to here, I guess <laughs> the action of C star is just multiplication of the phi of the Higgs field. Then that ac that action of this map is equivariant for an action of C star. It's not actually the trivial. It's not the usual action of C star on the affine space. There's a weight. Different coordinates are acted upon by by different uh, with different weights. But just think of that as a, it's basically <coughs> the usual action. And so the the base we can compact, compactify that to to a projective space of the same dimension. And the visor at infinity is it's a similar looking thing. It's just the affine space minus the origin modulo C star. This procedure, as I said, this is about the same thing as what's happening for the compactification of, of MH itself. Um, basically, anytime you have a variety in a C star action, if the C star action has the property that when you go towards zero, it, it, it lands you in a compact subset, that's the null potent cone, then uh, if we sort of take, take away that compact subset in the middle, and take the quotient of the rest by the C star action, that'll provide a divisor at infinity and you'll get a compactification. That's just the general. So, now let's just view, the, uh, there's this weight because the action of C star on AN is, is not the usual one. So it's a weighted projection space. And well, it's best to view this as a smooth GM, Dim, Dilly Mumford stack. And now when we look, make this projectivization, we get a map from the compactification to the projective space. Again, that's just pretty much because you, we use pretty much the same procedure to define these compactifications as we did to define that. So in particular, the, the divisor at infinity here maps to the, the n minus one dimensional weighted projective space that we put at infinity. Now, when we have a projective space, or for example, a weighted projective space, there's something called the hop vibration, which is a sphere dimension 2n minus 1, mapping to pn minus 1. And we can think of the sphere as being the quotient where we take the, the affine space minus the origin and divide by the action of r plus star. So instead of act, dividing by c star, we divide by real, positive real scalars. So that's going to be just the sphere. And uh, it doesn't really matter that there's the weight or not. It's always going to be the sphere. I'm not mistaken. Um, and so, so we have a map like that. That's an S1 one. Now we can just pull back that S1 bundle by this map. So we get a Cartesian diagram here. We have an S1 bundle here. We just pull that, we make a fiber product. We get an S1 bundle, uh, which we'll call K tilde, mapping to K. And again, it's the same thing. We take the Hitchin moduli space minus the nilpotent component and divide by the positive real scalars rather than C star. The, why am I doing all this is basically because uh, when we go out to infinity, this is going to depend on the, the, the sector in the complex plane, you know, the direction we, that we go out in the complex plane. If we sort of have a curve going out to infinity, uh, that curve is a complex is a complex uh, disk, for example. The, the, the behavior is going to depend on sectors in that disk, so we should sort of distinguish different sectors. Then we can, uh, sorry, then we can define what you might call Borel-Serre type of compactifications of these spaces, 
where instead of adding divisor k, we, let's just add, we means we sort of do a real blow up along this divisor. And instead of the divisor, we add the S1 bundle over the divisor. So again, we're just distinguishing directions as we go towards the divisor. So let's call that a 4L Sarah compactification. So we just add this K tilde instead of K. And then we can even go from there. We can then squish if we want, if we like. I'm oh, sorry. Because remember, we have a map from K tilde to the sphere. So we could just take the quotient top, as a topological space on the K tilde. So then take, contracting this K tilde to SN minus 2 and minus 1, we could get a compactification where you just add uh, the sphere and infinity. So these guys are not are no longer algebraic varieties. I mean, these guys are not algebraic varieties either. They're somewhat close to algebraic varieties. They're the real blow up. These guys, we've sort of squished a bunch of things. So this procedure, we could actually even squish more. We could just add the Pn minus 1. And that would be, uh, again, that would not be an algebraic variety, but it would be a little closer to an algebraic variety. That maybe one should think of as a Satake type of compactification. So this is kind of a circle bundle over Satake compactification. Now let's, on the other hand, go back and recall that we had this morgan chaling compactification of the character variety. Let's call KMS as the boundary. And well, it's kind of hard to say what the points correspond to, and people have written a lot of stuff on that. Roughly speaking, they correspond to valuations on the coordinate ring of the affine variety of the character variety. For the group SL2, uh, these valuations correspond to actions of the fundamental group on, on R trees. So, you can say sort of the Morgan Schillen boundary is equal to actions of the fundamental group on R trees in some way. Uh, and that's been extended recently by Parot, uh, who has shown that for higher rank uh, groups for SL3, SL4, and so on, that the Morgan Schillen boundary points also correspond to actions of pi 1 of x on Euclidean R building. That's kind of, this is kind of the thing that we're going to be looking at. Now, for the case of SL2, the these compactifications have been studied quite a lot by low-dimensional topologists. Um, so the literature is, is quite vast on that. Uh, one, one, one thing to know, which sort of makes a link between that literature and the stuff that we're looking at with the, with the Hitchin moduli spaces, is that Daskalopoulos, Dostoglu, and Wentworth have, this was like in the beginning of like 1990 or something like that, 1991 maybe? They defined a, a, a map between the morgan chalen boundary and this S2 minus N minus 1. Um, and they, sh they show that their map is homeomorphous. So we're interested in looking at something like this type of question. Uh, but we're interested in looking at that for groups bigger than SL2. But let me stick with SL2 for the moment. Let me just describe an example. So this, I think, is pretty much the simplest example where we're going to have a non-compact character variety. And I think it's an important example. It sort of shows you what happens, basically. Um, so it's important to understand this example. So let's, for this example, uh, unfortunately, it's not really a curve. It's a, it's a Dillian Mumper stack or an orbital. So x is p1. It's a root stack with p1. And we have four points. And then we add some denominators at those four points. We're going to look at representations of pi 1 of uh, this space. What that means, a representation of pi 1 of this space into SL2 is going to be a representation of pi 1 of p1 minus the four points, but such that the loops around the four points go to matrices of order n1, n2, n3, n4. So a matrix, a semi-simple matrix of order ni is going to be something of the form, for example, uh, zeta i, zeta i inverse, something conjugate to zeta i, i sorry, excuse me, that, that shouldn't be an equal, I should be a conjugate. Um, Something, it's a, the representation is something where the, the value rho of gamma i should be conjugate to a matrix of this form, where zeta i is, a, is an ni root of unit. So let's fix that data. So we'll fix the ni's, we'll fix the zeta i's, we'll fix these, the conjugacy classes of these matrices. Then, then you can define a moduli space, which is the, all the representations such that the matrices are conjugate. And the nice thing about that is that it's a, it's a two dimensional complex variety. So that's the sort of the smallest possible thing. Uh, because of the fact that there was a hyperkähler structure, it means that the real 
dimension is four is divisible by four, so the complex dimension is divisible by two. So we're not going to be able to have a one-dimensional example. Uh, so this is the smallest kind of example we can find. There's actually a certain number of examples that that uh, that are of this form. Uh, they're what they're they correspond to what's known as the panel of A equations, and this is the panel of A six equation. Uh, sorry, I guess, well, I should say, there's some other examples where there's only three points, uh, so there, there's no panel of equation because the points can't move. Uh, there's not too many examples. Now, on the, on the side of MH and M Duram, the convexifications are actually smooth orbifolds, if we assume that zeta is kind of generic. The convexifications are smooth orbifolds, and the divisor at infinity, well, it's the it's basically the elliptic curve, except it's not the elliptic curve, it's the elliptic curve divided by, t divided by the involution. So it's P1 with orbifold points of order two at these points. So it's the root stack. Now, if we look at the vibration, so S1, this is the, this is the S2n minus one, which came from the base of Hitchin vibration. And so this is basically the Hitchin vibration at infinity. It, uh, the fibers has, as we know, that the fiber of the Hitchin vibration is in Boolean variety. We have a two-dimensional moduli space. The Hitchin base has dimension one, so the fiber has dimension one. The fiber has to be an elliptic curve. And in fact, in this case, it's the elliptic curve that's branched over these four points in P1. So, uh, so the fiber is a torus, S1 cross S1. And if you think about it, if you do the calculation a little bit, you see that when you go around this S1, this, going around this S1 corresponds to going around the point at infinity in the A1 of the Hitchin phase. Uh, one can see that that's act the action is actually the hyperelliptic involution on, on the elliptic curve. So, uh, so it's, this is not a trivial vibration. It's a vibration where when you go once around S1, that, that acts by minus one. This k here is sort of the quotient of that action. Now, on the other hand, so that, that was the that was the Hitchin case. Remember, this divisor k is the same for the Hitchin and the for the Duram case. On the other hand, let's look at the character variety. The character variety. This is a classic thing called the Klein cubic surface. Cubic surface. This was studied in the 19th century. Um, not so easy to write down the equations, but so that was done in the 19th century. Um, I actually learned about that, and there's a nice paper by Domingo Toledo and Bill Goldman uh, discussing this thing. That's kind of where I learned about the existence of this thing. Um, maybe I should say relearned or something. But uh, so, so if you want to have a sort of a modern approach to this whole thing, look at this paper by Bill Goldman and Domingo Toledo. Um, it's a cubic surface in P3, and the divisor at infinity is a, is a triangle of, of P1. I mean, I should stress, this is an algebraic variety compactification. It's not the morgan shailing compactification. Uh, in some way, the morgan shailing compactification is a little bit like taking the limit of this guy if we start blowing up all, all these points a lot. Uh, anyway, here we're just fixing a single algebraic compactification. Um, this depends on a choice of generators of the fundamental group. Uh, we have to sort of choose some loops here and then uh, you know, there's a map, there's a break group action here. Uh, this compactification is not break group invariant, so we've made some choices to, to get this picture. Well, so if we take our cubic surface in P3, we have a, a plane which is tangent at three points, and the intersection is three copies of P1. And so these are three of the lines in the cubic surface. And the M, the, the character variety itself is the complement of these three lines. So that means that the, the neighborhood at infinity, so points near infinity, are points in this neighborhood that I shaded in here. Um, I'm sorry, that was supposed to be a brighter color of blue to sort of reflect the, 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 the ocean here, but <laughs> 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 I guess when it goes to the projector, it sort of gets it into the um, And here was the beach, right? Uh, so, the, so our points near infinity are this tubular neighborhood of this triangle P1. And, and it, so the, one can see that, in fact, it turns out that the, one can really identify just directly this puncture neighborhood at infinity, homotopically speaking, with, with the K tilde. 
and we have a map to S1, and the map to S1 is the one you see here, namely, we have a, a triangle P1, so that's a triangle, and we just map our, our we just sort of contract our, our neighborhood of infinity to that triangle, but to consider it's a real triangle. So that means, so remember these are P1, so that means that the segment from here to here, it's actually a C star. The, the transverse, the, the transverse thing is at S1, so the fiber over a point like that in our triangle, in our S1, is really going to be an S1 bundle over C star, so again an S1 across S1. The fiber near a point, like near a normal crossing point, is just a, a puncture disk across a puncture, puncture disk, so homotypically it's S1 across S1. And you can just sort of follow that around all the way. You see that the fiber over all the points is basically S1 cross S1, and as you go around, a little matrix calculation, there's a little, the, the matrix that, that goes from one point to the other is a little matrix, two by two matrix, such that its cube is equal to minus the identity. There's a little matrix with one minus one, minus zero minus one, I think, or something like that, minus one zero, whose cube is equal to the minus the identity. So you can just really identify in this in this particular case, you can identify everything that's going on. So from this example, we make the following conjecture. So we just sort of generalize this example to, to everything we want to say. What's going on here? Well, what's going on here is that if we, we take a normal crossings compactification M Betty bar, which is an algebraic variety, then we take its dual complex. So the dual complex is the thing where you put a vertex for every component, you put an edge every time two components intersect, you put a, a two cell every time three components intersect, and so on. You've got a simplicial complex. It's known by Danilov, Toulier, uh, Stepanov, and a, a number of people. It's known that the homotopy type of this complex is, is independent of the choice of compactification. Um, for Phil, the, the, the cohomology of this guy is the lowest piece of the weight filtration for the, for the fixed top structure. Um, so we have this we have this space which is the dual complex of any compactification that's independent of the choice of compactification. So the conjecture is that that should actually be a sphere. In, in this case, it was a circle. That should actually be a sphere. And the map from the link at infinity of our moduli space of local systems to the sphere should conjecturally co coincide with the map that we had before, k tilde mapping to S2 and minus one. So that's a conjecture. Um, <laughs> I wrote a paper uh, not too long ago showing that it, it really is, this, it, the first part is really true, it really is a sphere in the case of P1 minus N points and uh, rank two things. That may actually uh, possibly already have been known by the topologists. It's a little bit hard to, to go through the literature and the topology thing and see what is really known about this question. Um, Anyway, so some, there's some, a little bit of evidence for this conjecture. And in fact, the result that we said of Dostoglopoulos, Dostoglu, Wentworth actually provides us it with even more. It actually gives an identification between the sphere and, and some, a different compactification, but the morgan Shailen compactification here. The identification is only happening over an open subset. And well, uh, this, is just a, this is just an opinion, but it looks like you, uh, you might say, okay, can we extend the Dostoglopoulos, Dostoglu, Wentworth statement to be an actual homeomorphism directly between the two spaces? It looks like that might not be easy to do. Maybe there's a, maybe one can define one, but maybe not so naturally. Uh, it looks to me like probably what's going on is there's some sort of real blowing up and blowing down uh, uh, occurring here, which is should sort of preserve the homotopy type, but uh, there might be some uh, more complicated looking geometry. And in fact, uh, what we'll be seeing next is going to sort of show it. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I think that should be pretty much the same open set as they have. But we're going to see sort of a, a genericity condition on points in K, uh, where, out, where in the generic case, we can sort of describe pretty explicitly what, what the picture looks like. Along, the, along what are called the walls, um, it's less clear what's going on. So there, there may be some birational type of stuff happening along these walls. Okay, so next, now I'd like to talk about the WKB problem. So the WKB problem is the, it's the, the, the problem of uh, ordinary differential equations, which you get when you start trying to look more precisely at the, at the correspondence between these spaces. 
So we remember we have our let me go back here. We have these correspondences between moduli spaces. This correspondence is given by the Riemann Hilbert correspondence. What does that really mean? That means that here we have a space of vector bundles with interworld connection. And to go over here, we should solve an ODE to get the monodromy representation of, or, of, or, of the integrable connection. It means we're solving a, a system of ordinary differential equations to go from here to here. So if you want to understand what that, geometrically what that looks like, that means we need to know, sort of at least in the large, what the solution of uh, the system of, differ of differential equations is going to be doing. That's called the WKB problem. So what we're going to be doing now is we're going to sort of uh, restrict ourselves to, 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 to a more specific geometrical situation. So we'd like to look at sort of families of points in either MH or M Duram, which, which go out towards the point at infinity in the divisor K. And as I said, that, that it's going to depend on the direction. So it's a point of K tilde. So remember, K tilde is the space of Higgs bundles with a non-nil potent Higgs field phi. Uh, again, we're about to see what that really is. In just a minute. Um, and it's up to positive real scaling of phi. So we can really think of a point, our point at infinity k, kappa, as corresponding to a Higgs bundle. Except we just say that if we rescale phi by a positive real number, that that would sort of correspond to changing a normal coordinate direction uh, near the divisor at infinity. Now what's a, what's a Higgs field? Here's the thing I promised before. The Higgs field is just a map, a linear map of vector bundles from, you know, locally free sheaves, from our bundle E to E tensor omega 1x. Okay, so it's like a connection. A connection is going to be the same type of map, but a connection is going to be a map which satisfies the Leibniz formula. So a Higgs field, one way of thinking of a Higgs field is just the thing that you would use to perturb a connection. So if we take a connection in Nablo 0, then we can add a Higgs field, and we get a new connection in Nablo T. So let's add T times a, our Higgs field field. I wrote Nablo zero with some d plus m, you know, on a on an open set where e was trivial. Then we have the trivial connection, and a, a given connection is going to be the trivial connection plus uh, m, which is again of the same thing. Anyway, we just start with a connection Nablo zero, and then let's look at a family of connections Nablo t, where we add t times some Higgs field, and the the idea is that t is getting big. So we're going to have a family of connections where some coefficients of the matrices are getting big. Okay. T is going to infinity. So for any point T, let's let the transport from P to Q uh, as a function of T be the map from the fiber of E at P to the fiber of E at Q. So the transport matrix along a given path, I didn't include the path in the notation. Uh, soon we'll be going to the universal cover anyway. Um, so it's the transport from P to Q. So that means we solve differential of the ODE given by this connection. We solve for functions such that nablo zero plus t times phi times the, the vector of phi should be equal to zero. Along, and then we solve, take the, the solution going from the path from the point P to the point Q, and that this gives us a transport function. So we're interested in understanding the rate of growth of this function as a function of t. This is called classically called singular perturbation theory. So it turns out it's going to depend on a real ray in the complex plane. So it's going to depend on which direction t goes to infinity. That's why we did this k tilde thing. So let's look at t. Of course, by uh, we can adjust the real ray just by multiplying phi by e to the i theta to change the angle. So let's just assume that t is a positive real number. Now we have a similar problem for the for the Higgs bundle moduli space itself because of course we can also always take a Higgs field and perturb it by adding another Higgs field. But in fact, we can even just take the Higgs field itself. So this is a somewhat simplified, this is not the most general possible statement you could make, but uh, a simplified version of the problem you could do here. Let's just consider the Higgs bundle E with T times phi as Higgs field. Then we solve Hitchens' equations. We let DT be the associated flat connection. And again, we have a transport for, for this flat connection. So in this case, we're not, only, we're not just solving uh, uh, system of ODEs, we're solving a system of PDEs to get the, the solution of Hitchens equations to get the connection, and then we solve the ODEs to get the transport of that connection. So that's what we'll, we would call the Hitchens WKB. Uh, 
And in this case, we also have something additional, which is that the harmonic metric from the solution here uh, <coughs> actually depends on t. So this gives us a way we can measure the size in a way which is kind of adapted to this to this setting. <coughs> now we would like to, to uh, we'd like to define an exponent which is going to measure the exponential growth <coughs> of this guy. Well, first of all, I should say if you think about sort of your your basic course in differential equations. The, the size of the solution of the differential equation is going to be exponential in the size of the coefficients okay, as a general matter. So the size of this TPQ is going to be some exponential of, of T. And this exponent it just means let's look at the best possible exponent bound. So we'd like to take the limit of 1 over T times the log of the size of this matrix. That limit may or may not exist. So one thing to do would be to define a limb soup. That would really be the best possible exponent. Um, another thing to do, which actually turns out this is Parot's theory, uh, which is we should pick an ultrafilter. An ultrafilter means just a point at infinity in the stone check compactification. And then we can take the limit. Uh, then these guys are bounded numbers uh, depending on t uh, by, the, by the basic ODE bound. Um, so we can find something called the exponent depending on the ultrafilter. And we can also define the vector exponent, which I don't want to give a precise definition, but in the SL3 case, the vector exponent can be obtained from the exponent going from B to Q. The vector exponent has three components. Uh, but the top component is, is the exponent for P to Q. The bottom component is the negative of the exponent from Q to P. And the middle component is determined by the fact that it's in SL3, so the sum of those guys should be zero. Now, our, our WKB problem is depending on this Higgs field, phi, right? Uh, I'm sorry, either here or here. The, the fact that we, the, the term that we perturbed to add. Okay? Now, this phi Higgs field has what's called a spectral curve. So, uh, I didn't, sorry, I didn't put a slide about spectral curves here. The spectral curve, it just means let's, at each point of the Riemann surface x, let's look at the, the eigenvalues of phi, phi considered as an endomorphism of the bundle. It's a twisted endomorphism. It's an endomorphism with coefficients in the canonical bundle. So the eigenvalues are, are sections of kx also, or sections of omega 1x. So they're really eigen one form. And let's just note by phi star the, the collection of r different one forms. Uh, so these are all defined up to permutation. Now, Parot's theorem uh, Rose theorem is that there is going to be a harmonic map to a building. Depending on the the building depends on the, the ultra filter omega. That's kind of one of the main ingredients that Perot uh, included here. There's going to exist a harmonic map such that the exponent is what's called the Finsler distance. In the next slide, I'll be talking about Finsler distance. Uh, it's what's called the Finsler distance in the building. Uh, maybe I should say that this is a this is an Euclidean R building. Uh, such that we can, that our exponent is the distance from h of p to h of q. And a similar way, of, I mean, a similar version of this property is that uh, the vector exponent is the vector distance from h of p to h of q in, in the building. Now, our, uh, our own little contribution here was that in the case of the WKB problem, of, of the Hil Riemann Hilbert WKB problem, uh, we showed that the differential of this map is actually. Uh, the real part of this phi. Perot was considering, in fact, it wasn't really considering a uh, variety, it was considering a, actions of a group on a building and looking at you know, sequences of uh, points in the character variety and said, that, okay, there's going to be an eliminating action of the group on a building obtained by, by taking an ultra filter limit. Um, we just kind of did a groupoid version of that where we had all the different points of x all together and then differentiating using the classical WKB theory from like 1920, uh, just the classical very local WKB approximation, allows you to differentiate this map and show that, that the differential is given by the spectral curve. And then Takara Mochizuki, uh, subsequent to a recent paper that you might know of by Matsuo Soboto, Weiss, and Bitt, uh, Takara Mochizuki proved the same statement for the Hijin WKB problem. In our paper, we had sort of raised that as a question, but uh, didn't know how to prove it. So, so now that's also known for for both WKB problems. So now, the, the, this, this theorem 
gives us the following motivation. Can we calculate the distance that's in the building? Right, we have this map to the building. We know that the exponent is equal to the distance from one point to the other. And we know that the derivative of the map to the building is given by our, our one point. Okay. So can we sort of integrate this derivative that we know of the map to the building, sort of see what the long range distances between the points are? to calculate the exponents. Or you might say the goal here is to calculate the exponent from one point to another. That amounts to saying, just as a very first order approximation, what's the size of the solution of this ODE as a function of t? And so we, we take a system of ODEs with a large parameter in it. We'd like to say, you know, how big is the, the, the solution? So the question is, can we use this, the fact that we know the derivative to actually uh, calculate the distance? Well, so this would uh, provide us with many things uh, if, if we are able to do so. Um, so we should theoretically be able to say what the, say more about the morgan shaylin boundary points because the morgan shaylin boundary points are sort of given by these distance, fun they're given by these exponents considered as a length function on the grooves. Um, we might be able to generalize, uh, we don't currently know how to do this, but we might be able to generalize uh, their result. It would give, a, among other things, we would, we would get a calculation of this problem for a system of ODEs. And in fact, our, our actual motivation was for mirror symmetry. So uh, we're hoping to be able to use this theory to generalize the Bridgeland Smith uh, construction of stability conditions on drive category. So now I'd like to just a little bit, a little bit more quickly run through. Uh, what, what we come up with, so we're, we've only been able to really say something from now on for the group SL3. The point about the group SL3 is that the, our Riemann surface X has dimension 2, and the building for SL3 also has a real dimension 2. So there's going to be a similarity of dimension between the, the Riemann surface and the, the building that we're mapping into. For SL4, SL5, and so on, the building is going to be bigger than the group. That, there we don't really know how to talk about points in the building. So we're going to try to, in the SL3 case, we're going to try to construct points of the building. We don't know what the building is. The building a priori in Perot's theory is some gigantic thing obtained by the ultrafilter and some compact, Gromov compactness argument and so on. So we're trying to sort of construct what's the image of our map from X into the building is going to look like in an a priori way using the differential. So we're restricting to SL3. So this, I'm just saying this is a very major restriction. Uh, and it's a major question what one might be able to do, even assuming we can understand what's happening here, which is not completely finished. But assuming we can understand what's happening here, then it's a major question to understand what would happen for higher rank groups. It's not just a, a small generalization. Okay, so let's take the universal cover, and then we take our, oh, I'm sorry about this. I put tildes in because x was, at the start, x was a compact Riemann surface. Now we want x to be our sort of open, universal, simply connected Riemann surface. The tilders are going to sort of semi go away in a minute, unfortunately. Um, we have our spectral curve. This is the set of eigenforms of, of the Higgs field, considered as a, as a curve in the cotangent model. It projects to x, and we have ramification points. So let's consider the branch locus. Away from the branch locus, the inverse image consists of three points z1, z2, z3, and the images in the cotangent models are exactly these eigen one forms of the Higgs field. So these are just what, these are the forms you get on the diagonal when you diagonalize feet, basically. Um, well, what's going on here is we're in, we're in the SL3 case, so the sum of these three guys is zero. So it turns out that we will actually be interested in the real parts of these differential forms. So these are real differential forms on, the, on our Riemann surface. Let's put phi j, phi i minus phi j. And we'll talk about a foliation line, which is going to be a real curve on x on which one of these a real part of phi j vanishes. So in the SL3 case, there's three of them. There's 1, 2, 2, 3, and 1, 3. And they're negatives, but the negatives define the same foliation line. So on any point in the Riemann surface, there's three different foliation lines. Um, now, near a branch point, there's a single index which is not concerned. We're assuming that there's, the branch points are simple. So a branch point permutes two of the three indices. There's a third index which is not concerned. So there's two indices which are interchanged. And the, the picture for the foliation concerning, you know, for the two foliations, the I, the, for the Rij foliation at a branch point, looks like that. Okay. 
Now, uh, Gaiuto Mornitsky, so, so this is the work which we've been interested in looking at, the work of Gaiuto Mornitsky. They've defined a subset of X called the spectral network. <coughs> it starts by using the initial foliation lines coming out of the branch point. So every time we have a branch point, we have these three singular foliation lines. That's sort of the start of the spectral network. However, so, and we can talk about the spectral network in the case of SL2, but in the case of SL2, that, that only consists, in the case of SL2, there's only a single foliation given by a quadratic differential, and, it, and there's only these uh, singular leaves of the foliation. But in the case of SL3 and higher, something new happens, so, which is called a collision point. This is what the guy and Mornitsky have actually introduced. So let me just draw a picture of a collision. Uh, I'm sorry, maybe I should say one thing, which is, remember this was a point where, this was a point for the IJ, uh, this, this point was labeled IJ because I and J were the two sheets of the spectral curve that were interchanged when we went around this branch point. So these, no, sorry. these guys are labeled IJ. Now if we have a guy, if you have a line labeled IJ, so that means it came from a singularity way back here. We have also a line labeled JK, which came from a singularity back here. Then they can collide and form a new line called I, labeled IK. So this new line did not come from a singularity. It came from colliding these two guys. And they're, you know, these guys are physicists, so they like to collide stuff. Um, now something called a BPS state, which I guess stands for Bogomolny Passat Sommerfeld or something like that, uh, which has to do with black holes maybe or something like that, among other things. Anyway, for us, it's just a combinatorial structure on the Riemann surface. It's obtained, it's what you get when you start with the singular points. You start zipping out these spectral network curves, then you allow them to collide, and then you, you keep doing that. And if you get back, you know, every time two guys collide, then they create a new single line. And then they, it might collide with somebody else and so on. But there's always sort of the line which is being created. If that line that's being created sort of runs head on back into a singularity, it sort of stops there. Then that's called a BPS state. So here I've drawn a BPS state with three collision points and uh, fives. Well, let me just uh, skip over this about something about BPS state could have a picture like that, but actually you can sort of shrink the hexagon and get something of the form that we were discussing. Okay, so this is also sort of the history of spectral network. Let me like, read that for a minute. Let me check one more time. Um, so spectral networks are useful for lots of things. Um, Gaiuto Marnetsky has sort of said all of this stuff, basically. That you, they, they're related to WKB asymptotics. They're related to Bridgel and Smith's theory. So that's why we're inter we start we were interested in spectral networks. Uh, this is, I mean, Ludwig, I don't know who else here had to go. But uh, anyway, uh, Ludwig and his group were interested in looking at the Brindle and Smith construction and stability condition. Um, the concentric slogan and wall crossing is going to, so it, uh, it, the wall crossing is when the whole thing moves around a little bit. And every time you get to a BPS state, that's, that's going to be when you're on a wall. So what we have sort of been looking at adding to this whole picture here is the notion of harmonic maps to building. So and then we've noticed that uh, because when, when we when when we started looking at when when Gaiuto Marnatsky said okay this is related to WKB asymptotics, then and also when we started this is maybe where Fabian made a crucial remark when we started looking at Bridgeland Smith theory and saying okay the, what's happening in Bridgeland Smith theory looks very closely related to this foliation defined by the quadratic differential from the foliation you could get a tree. And the walls were the places where the tree acquired a BPS state. Okay. So all, all that theory sort of started making uh, Ludmill and I, who'd been interested in harmonic maps uh, from some time ago, we started saying, oh, you know, this looks like harmonic maps, so why don't we look at harmonic maps? Uh, it took us quite some time to understand what was going on, but uh, so here's the, here's the presentation of what we sort of understood here. Okay. So, 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 what, so this is what we're looking at, is harmonic maps to building. Now, let's, what's a building? A building, so this is just very brief. A building is something, is a space which is covered by things called apartments. An apartment is just a, a Euclidean space. So the apartment for SL3 is R2. But R2 should be thought of as X1, X2, X3, set whose sum is equal to zero. So there's really three different directions in here. And inside the Euclidean R2, these three directions are three different directions separated by 60 degrees. Okay. So you know, if you draw a point, you draw the six different lines, so that's three different you know, directions uh, separated by 60 degrees. 
that's kind of the picture of the local structure of what's going on in the standard department for SL3. Okay. The bio group, which is the set of permutations in one, two, three, acts on this and it preserves these directions. Then what, what we'll call an enclosure is that anybody, is any sort of compact <laughs> closed subset of R2, which is bounded by the lines going only in these three directions. I don't know if that's very well drawn here, but these, got, these lines are all supposed to be, fall into three different parallel families of, of line. Okay. And a construction is anything made by gluing together all these guys along their edge. In particular, an apartment, so for construction we said compact, but an apartment is a construction, sorry, for enclosure we said compact, but an apartment is a construction by just tiling it in any, any way you want. Now, we'd like to understand uh, what it means to have a harmonic map from an open subset of X into one of, into the standard apartment or even into a, just a, a construction or, or an enclosure. Now, we can take the differential of the map. So if we think of A as being the set of, set of points like that, and remember back here we had, uh, way back here we had phi one plus phi two plus phi three equals zero. Okay. That means that uh, that means that the the coordinates x one, x two, x three on A sort of look the same, and in fact the, the the permutation group action is kind of the same as the our differential forms here. And so we'll say that H is a harmonic map associated to the spectral curves sigma if the differential is equal to this triple of, of real parts of phi. And that's kind of permutation invariant. Now an affine building is a, it's a construction which is negatively curved, that's kind of the principal property. And it's covered by things called apartments. Uh, there's a bunch of axioms which I'm not gonna write down. Uh, so you might be familiar with the notion of building. Uh, the main example, the first example were Bruat its buildings associated to groups of the form SL3, uh, SL, SL something or other with coefficients in QP. And well, just let me be brief, extremely brief here, but we're, we're interested in the same type of thing as SL3 QP or SL3 of a non-Archimedean value field, except we're actually looking at the germs of functions on R at infinity and the, the valuation is the ex exponential growth rate. The only problem is that's not really a field. And the fact that that's not a field, it's why you need to introduce the notion of ultra filter. So this is a theory of Perot, Kleiner, Lieb, and go back to other people too. Uh, here's just some properties of buildings. Maybe let me just say it for a minute. Uh, so one of the properties is that any two points are contained in a common apartment. Then you can define the vector distance between two points as put them in a common common apartment, then look at the vector from in R2 from one point to the other. And that's but the, the coordinates are, are there's a permutation action on the space of coordinates. So that's not a well-defined point. But if we move it into the positive wild chamber, then it's a well-defined point. That's going to be the vector distance. So it turns out that's a well-defined thing. Then the Fitzor distance is just the maximum coordinate of the vector distance. It's not the same as the Euclidean distance. So a harmonic, uh, harmonic map associated to the spectral curve is a, is a map such that, uh, except for a discrete set of singularities, which is gonna be our, our set of branch points Q, for any point, there's a neighborhood of that point and, a, and an apartment such that the map factors through the apartment through a harmonic map whose differential is given by, the, by, this, uh, by this condition. So, so we can kind of restate our problem. Our main question is, how can we understand geometrically the harmonic maps associated to our given spectral curve using just, just using this differential condition? Now, now we get to the sort of geometry of the situation. So we have three foliation lines. There are some points where the three foliation lines could actually all three be tangent. We'll call that a caustic. At a caustic, the map to the building sort of folds the Riemann surface along that caustic. So maybe I'll just skip over this briefly, uh, rapidly. Uh, you can define it. You can just, I mean, the, the first thing you would try to do uh, was you could define an initial construction uh, and a harmonic map to that construction with a factorization property. The only 
Uh, well, for one thing, that depends on the choice of, of covering. But the main problem is that the initial construction is going to contain points of positive curvature. So, uh, in particular, it's going to contain what we call a, a fourfold points, where four only four sectors of 60 degrees come together. No, yeah, all the points are kind of. I mean, the, the link of the points divided into sectors of, of 60 degrees, right? Because uh, the only the geometry of our our apartment is determined by these three sets of lines. So let me just explain how a uh, how a fourfold point comes out comes about. So this you can, we can see that this is a picture more more or less the same picture from our from our paper. Um, this yellow line in the middle that's the caustic. Uh, these three these two points are singular points, and these two points are collision points. The the black lines are spectral network lines. And so let me just draw the picture. So this is a picture of the Riemann surface X. And now, now let me draw the picture of the, the, the map from X into the building. It's going to look like that. So, so this is two sheets of stuff here. They are there. Like that also. So all down here, there's two sheets. Up here, this whole stuff is all squished together to the same sheet. So we go back. It means that this central region got folded along the caustic line. Uh, folded together. But the folding stopped at these black lines, and so this part up here and this part down here are distinct. So here, we, here, here everything is folded together, and up here everything is distinct. Well, our initial construction is just the same picture, except for we only fold together these shaded re regions. We only do the folding along the shaded regions, but you know, the, 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 the global folding is a global thing. We don't know that we're supposed to fold a, yeah, a point here to a point here. By kind of local considerations, you can see that locally along the caustic, one can see that one has to fold the neighborhood. So the initial construction, let me just go to the picture. So kind of a picture of the initial construction at a point, one of these green points, is going to look like that. So we folded together the, stuff, the shaded stuff, but we didn't fold together the stuff here. And you can see from this picture that inside this, inside this uh, region, there's going to be four sectors of 60 degrees, which are consecutive. That makes a positively degree a positive curved point. In any map from that guy into a negatively curved building, uh, these four sectors have to collapse. So let me just, instead of doing the text, let me just sort of click through the pictures. So here, here's a picture of the collapsing. So when we have four, so these are supposed to be four sectors of 60 degrees each, but you can't draw it on a flat surface. This is a positively curved point. But the total angle at one of these points is only 240 degrees instead of 360. A negatively curved point would have an angle bigger than 360. But now the problem, so the problem here is that one of these points with four sectors, in principle you can fold it to, together in two different ways. It's like this little, you know, the little paper and toy thing. You can either fold it like that or like that. Okay. So in fact, the, and this is really the problem, if, if there was a canonical way of determining how this should be folded together, then we wouldn't, then we'd pretty much be done, basically. You would just say, you know, just every time, so this is one of these fourfold points. Every time you see a fourfold point, you know, fold it the way you're supposed to fold it, and then just keep doing that. And you can see here, you would end up eventually folding together all of this stuff, and you would have the answer. Uh, so you know, the answer is kind of this picture with that stuff folded together. That's what we call the pre-building. That's going, but the, that's going to be the image of X inside uh, inside any building is going to going to look like that. Okay. So now the so the, the fundamental problem in the reduction process is that we don't know at a fourfold point which way it should be folded. So we need extra data, which is what we call a scaffolding. So <coughs> if you think about it, in our Riemann surface, uh, there was, would be a, if we take a, this in this picture, this came from a, a piece of our Riemann surface. In, w in which case, on one of these sheets, you would look at a little open set around this line, and you would say, okay, but this, but my condition for being a harmonic map is that this little disk maps into an apartment in the building. And that map is given by integrating these one forms. So that little disk is not supposed to be folded. So we know in this case that, oh sorry, we know in this case that these edges are not supposed to be folded. Well, these edges were just get obtained by gluing together some stuff and we don't know anything about them. So from that we can actually conclude that these edges have to be folded because somebody has to be folded. And the fact that these guys are not folded tells you that uh, tells you the, the information you need for the scaffolding. It tells you that you know, the scaffolding is like we're holding up, we're sort of making some, some, uh, some rigidity in some parts of the construction. 
Um, so, so these guys are sort of maintained open, you might say. That tells us that we're supposed to fold in one direction, but not, not in the other. So the scaffolding is going to be data of edges that are folded or not folded throughout the whole Riemann surface. Then the problem is, so, okay, now we start folding stuff. Then we have to, in the, new, in the new picture, we have to sort of understand what the new scaffolding is. Because when we fold stuff together, that creates a new edge. We don't a priori know whether it's supposed to be folded or not uh, later on. So that's kind of the stuff we're, we're doing now. So let me just sort of draw the reduction process and maybe I'll stop. So you know, the reduction process to go again, uh, to, to you this again, is we're going to have you know, a parallelogram like that with a fourfold point up here and two different parallelograms that are going to have to be folded together. And from the scaffolding, we sort of know which direction they're supposed to, they're supposed to be folded. Then we fold them together. Then we can do something else, which is interesting, which is once we fold them together, we can actually cut that piece off and throw it away. So of course, we've, we've thrown out some stuff. So, so to get back to the WKB information, we might have to put, put it back in and be careful about what's happening. But just sort of for the geometry of the situation, we can just cut that stuff off and throw it away. The nice thing about that is we're again left with a Riemann surface. Okay? The stuff that's left over here is again a, sur is again a surface. Whereas if you know if we if we looked at this picture, if we looked at this picture, this this whole thing is not a surface, right? At a point here, there's three different sheets that are coming together. Okay? But the point is that as it turns out, as we go through this process, we can just trim away systematically the stuff that we just previously folded together and just throw it out. We get a sequence every month. So what's interesting about that is that this sequence of Riemann surface, once it converges, once we've gotten rid of all the fourfold points, it's only going to have eightfold curvature points or flat points. And this, we get a new Riemann surface with a flat structure. Uh, and in fact, with a structure, a geometric structure of, you know, it's a flat structure, but the model on this, uh, the apartment of the building, and it has some positively curved points, uh, some negatively curved points. In some sense, the this negative. So here, uh, sorry, here it's going to be a picture of this negatively curved points. In some sense, that, that negatively curved point was really a concentration of some negative curvature that was kind of, at the start, spread out along the caustic line. Then when we did the initial construction, if you think about it, we sort of discretized the curvature which is spread out along this line. We discretized it to an 8, a 4, 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 an 8. A four, an eight. If you total all that up, that makes a total of you know, an 8 full point. But the fours and the eights cancel out, but we get an extra equal point. And this process basically squishes together all that stuff. And we, at the end, we just get a single eightfold point. So now this is just a picture to finish uh, to explain. So the, the theorem is going to be that there's gonna, so there's going to be an obstruction to this process. The obstruction to this process is the existence of BPS states in the spectral network. Those are walls in the space of, of everybody. So, the so what we're going to be saying is that if there are no BPS states in the spectral network, then the theorem will be, uh, we haven't finished the proof, but the theorem will be that in that case we can continue the reduction process, we can sort of define the scaffolding at each step and come up with a uh, the process that there's maybe convergence questions also, but assuming that it converges, um, we'll get down to a, a sort of a final version, which is going to be one of these flat, uh, flat Riemann surfaces with just these eightfold points. But let me just explain in pictures why it is that a VPS state might sort of lead to an obstruction. So suppose we squish this up together and we have two different eightfold points that which happen to lie on the same uh, foliation line, you know, the same line in one of these preferred in our preferred three families of line. So the picture is going to look something like that. Then we can draw two different trapezoids on the two different pieces below. We can either glue those together or, or not glue them together. So in this case, you might say, if we glue them together, then the eightfold points have moved down to here, basically. Okay. So if you have a situation, so and, and this guy from here to here is a, is a little mini BPS state. So if you have a BPS state, then in principle, maybe not always, but in principle, you might have a situation where the, the, the result of the reduction process is not well determined. And so the, the vague idea is that, that would be, that's what I was talking about, about birational geometry. Maybe along the walls, or maybe in some you know, higher codimensions piece of the stratification given by the walls, there may be some flips and flops occurring uh, in what's happening with this reduction process. Uh, anyway, so I was going to 
described the application, but uh, we don't know how to do that anyway, so we just stop here. Questions? What? Could you say a couple of words about the stability conditions application? Uh, okay, well, come on. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so, so the, the main point is that it's this idea that when we do a folding together, we can then trim it away. And so we get a, we get a sequence of, of, of two manifolds that sort of reduce in size. We sort of, and if you think about it, uh, this stuff, I'm sorry, this stuff was some piece of the original two manifold, but then out of that piece, we've cut out some stuff and then glued the edges together. So maybe if we go back to the original picture, this is kind of, pretty much the only picture I really fully understand. Here we would cut out this whole middle diamond shaped region, just throw it away and glue, you know, this edge gets glued to this edge and this edge gets glued to this edge. And what's left over is our, is our what we would, might call the core. Uh, that's actually related to something called the Stallings theory of core graphs. Uh, it seems to be sort of a two dimensional version of Stallings core graphs. Um, uh, sorry. So anyway, so we can have this process of of reducing our Riemann surface to uh, to our Riemann surface where uh, where you, there's this flat structure, and if you think about it a little bit, that's that has a new complex structure. So we're really sort of modifying the complex structure on the Riemann surface. It has a new complex structure. It has it has some conical points with 480 degree uh, angle at the conical points, but also this this new Riemann surface has a canonical sort of spectral curve over it, which are the three different differentials. But now it's a cyclic spectral curve. It's now, now the spectral, spectral curve is a cyclic covering. So it turns out that in terms of spectral curve, that's the spectral curve given by just a three differential. Generally speaking, for the equation of the spectral curve for SL3, there's going to be a quadratic differential and a triple and a cubic differential. But this guy is a spectral curve given only by a cubic differential. So the basic idea is that we would then like to say, okay, we have this way of reducing to a uh, spectral curve with a cubic differential we get this core. The only thing is that that core might depend on the direction, on the direction that we started. So if we replace phi by e to the i theta times phi, that the core will be different. So for each different phase, we'll have a different core. Now the project we're currently trying to work on, and I think here Fabian is also uh, participating, the project we're currently trying to work on is to define the stability conditions in the case of a, trip of a cubic differential. If we can, so then the theory of how this might apply to get a generalization of bridge smith is suppose we can define a stability condition for a cubic differential, then we get a stability condition for each one of these core guys. Then we can try to define the category of objects of phase less than or equal to theta by taking the core at that phase theta, maybe there should be a minus sign here or something, taking the core at that phase theta, using the stability condition that we would know by the cubic differential um, to define the d less than or equal to theta. And then sort of just combine those guys together for different values of theta to create a stability condition in general. Uh, so it's not going to be a stability condition associated to a cubic differential. It's going to be sort of a stability condition where each one of the each one of the the hearts, or these are a bunch of different hearts of T structures. Each one of the hearts is going to sort of be the heart of a stability condition for a cubic differential. But that cube, that Riemann surface with a cubic differential is going to sort of be changing as we change theta. So that's sort of very quick. Any other question? Okay, so let's thank our speaker again. Okay.